Alrighty, what's going on everybody and welcome to another episode of Time Out with Doc and Caveman. As always, you are here with Dr. Fantasy and the Fantasy Caveman. We are starting to climb up the standings here in the Eastern Conference. So we're going to be talking about the Indiana Pacers, talking about last season and where we see them finishing uh, in 2021-22. So before we get rolling, make sure you guys subscribe on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts if you prefer the audio version. But we've got lots of traction on YouTube, trying to get more subscribers, so we'd appreciate the support if you do subscribe. But let's roll right with the Indiana Pacers today. So recapping last season, they were 34 and 38, which was good for ninth in the Eastern Conference. They, interestingly enough, they were sixth in points per game, so very, uh, very often. Offensively, they were very potent last season. Uh, they were only 14th in efficiency, though, and then 13th in defensive efficiency. Their head coach last season was Nate Bjorkin. Uh, let's see, a couple other random stats. 16th in three-point percentage, 15th in three-point percentage allowed, and then 21st in rebounding, so they weren't very strong down on the boards. Uh, overall, it was a pretty average season. This is a team that when you look at it from all aspects, from every facet of the game, they really were average. So and where they finished in the standings kind of reflects that. Going over some of their season leaders, Malcolm Brogdon led the way with 21.2 points. Karis LeVert with 20.7. Sabonis had 20.3, so three guys above 20 points there. Rebound Sabonis at 12. Miles Turner at 6.5. Assists, also Sabonis at 6.7, TJ McConnell at 6.6, and then Malcolm Brogdon at 5.9. Steals, TJ McConnell led the way there with 1.9, Karis LeVert at 1.5, and Sabonis at 1.2. Then rounding it out, Miles Turner with 3.4 blocks. So, Caveman, who stood out to you for the Pacers last season? And this is a team where I feel like there's definitely, you definitely have a couple guys, but I just want to... He didn't really stand out per se, but I just want I just want to give a props to Karis Levert coming back from you know the the kidney the kidney stuff the set and the stuff he was going through. So it was happy. I, I was happy as an NBA fan to see him uh, back on the court. So that so that so that I would that I really liked. Uh, in terms of guys that impressed me, I mean, for me the guy that stands out and I didn't know I didn't know he had was doing that good when uh when I was watching the team, but Miles Turner, I mean Miles Turner's a guy where remember early on in the year he was in defensive player of the year contention. Like he three three point four blocks per game. That's I mean that that that's that would be that's all right, wouldn't you say? I mean that's that's not average. Too bad. Average people average three and a half blocks a game all the time. Uh, but no, I think really think he is a defensive superstar. Uh, his ability to protect the rim for this team, especially you, you look at when you talk, you mentioned it with their uh efficiency and stuff, they weren't very good defensively last season. Uh, and I think part of that is the fact that Miles Turner only played 47 games for him. Uh, he was kind of, not that Sabonis is a terrible defender, but I really think that for the Pacers, I think Sabonis needs Turner in that front court for the defensive presence beside him. Uh, so I think that he, just Miles Turner from a defensive standpoint really stood out uh, for me. And just overall, I... I it, it sucks with the Pacers because we talk about it all the time. Uh, I just don't understand why they can't take the lead. This team has so many good pieces that they honestly, on paper, should be a top four seed in the Eastern Conference pretty much every year based on the talent that they have on their roster. But... They just can never seem to put it together. That's kind of that's kind of what I take overall from the last season. It's just they just didn't they just struggled to live up to expectations. 
Yeah, and that's why I'm excited. We'll talk about in additions for this team during the offseason. Rick Carlisle, I think, is going to be really critical for them. Um, But two guys that stood out to me, Malcolm Brogdon, you have to bring up. He had, yes, he uh, was a borderline all-star player last year. He should have made the all-star team, but he kind of took that next jump that you wanted to see if he could take. He went from a very solid guard, a great defensive presence, to really taking that jump into being an all-star level player. So uh, his three-point percentage went up compared to his previous year with the Pacers. uh, Still shot over 85% from the free throw line. Was a great playmaker and really was a leader on the court for them. So I think that was a nice, a nice development. He just, he just needs to stay healthy. Yeah, and he only he played 56 games last year. I played 54 the year before that. So he really hasn't consistently played even anywhere close to 80 games throughout the course of his career. So that'll definitely be a key. I mean, that's kind of this team in general. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Miles Turner. Brogdon, you know, if these guys played a full, you know, 75 plus games, is this a team that would have finished with a better record? I would definitely bet and say that they would have. Um, So Brogdon, you definitely got to bring up the nice improved season that he had. Then the other guy is TJ McConnell, who I still don't think gets enough credit in general, but he was really good off the bench for him and played a lot of critical minutes when Brogdon wasn't in the lineup. Uh, I mentioned some of the stats. He was among their leaders, and a lot of them led the team in steals. He's an above-average defender, uh, which is a definitely an underrated part of his game, but he's a really good defender on the perimeter for him. Uh, was a great playmaker, averaging almost seven assists a game. And when you're talk, We talk about it time and time again when we do these previews, but you say, who's leading the second unit? And yep. TJ McConnell, you can be confident, is a fantastic ball best. handler and playmaker. He's and I... Yeah, and well, definitely one of the best. And I would even go on the side of saying that he could potentially be a sixth man of the year candidate moving forward. Uh, I don't think that's too far off to say, but definitely in the conversation, at least I think there's a lot of strong candidates. But I think he took a huge leap. He really I don't want to say he's been irrelevant throughout the course of his career, but honestly, kind of. Uh, I mean, he had one season about five years ago that was decent when the 76ers where he had comparable numbers, but throughout the course one of his season, career. five years ago. With yeah. He d- yeah. So, I mean, he really hasn't been that relevant during the yeah. course of his career. So I thought that was a nice uh, breakthrough season for him, proving that he has a role in this league. So uh, let's go to some of their off season acquisitions and start looking forward a little bit. Through the draft, they had two first-round picks. They got Chris Duarte, 13th overall, and then Isaiah Jackson, 22nd overall, who will slide in, probably backing up the four and five realistically for them this season. Um, So those were their two draft picks. Free agent additions, there's not much to talk about here unless I'm completely missing something. This is going to be a team that looks fairly similar to last year. Rick yeah. Carlisle is probably their biggest Chris, Chris, addition. Chris, Chris, Rick Carlisle is their biggest offseason uh, Yeah, I mean, honestly, at this point, they did bring in Tory Craig as well, who will be a solid role player off the bench for them. But they got a loss more than they gained this offseason as the whole loss Aaron Holiday Doug McDermott going over to the Spurs, Jakar Sampson, and Cassius Stanley, who didn't play a lot of minutes, but I always thought he had a little more potential than he's uh, shown thus far in his career. But uh, mm-hmm. any other notes you want to throw in there? And what do you think about this kind of boring offseason for the Pacers? Yeah, I mean, I'm the, obviously their offseason was in the draft, and, you know, I like I like there are a lot of people, you know, they're kind of lukewarm on their draft with Duarte and... Jack, like I love both of them for the fit for what this team uh is trying to do going forward, especially with Carlisle. I think Chris Duarte slides in. He's like six 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 seven. Uh, just brings that experience. Uh, seems like that's the kind of thing that Carlisle likes on with his with his teams is he kind of likes those experienced <laughs> players and. Duarte, I believe, was one of one of, if not like the oldest player in the draft class. Uh, so I think he comes in is a perfect fit for uh, Car- Carlisle's system. Uh, 
he can play the two and three. He can kind of play both of those positions. Uh, and Isaiah Jackson is going to have a solid role because you got Miles Turner also has had a little bit, has struggled has struggled to stay healthy. So uh, not only is he probably going to be the top uh, big man off the bench this season, uh, he. He's going to really have a chance to have a significant role because you're asking a lot out of Miles Turner to stay healthy, if we're being honest. Uh, and it's plus, you can't play Sabonis and Turner 48 minutes a game each. <laughs> Not how that works. Uh, this isn't the 90s anymore where guys play 48 <laughs> minutes a game. Uh, so Jackson's going to have, from day one, he's going to have a pretty solid role on this team. I know they have Tory Craig who will be mixed in there and uh another guy i guess uh but yeah i love their for what this team is trying to do going forward i love their draft uh other than that was their offseason obviously i love the carlisle pick great pickup for him especially because they haven't been able to get over the hump and i think carlisle can take this team and we'll talk about it later I really think he can take this team uh, and give and get them farther than they've gotten mm-hmm. the past couple, several years. For sure. Yeah, this is a team that's felt like it's just needed that coach to bring all of these elements together. Because when you look at what they have with Brogdon, Lavert, Sabonis, and Turner, I mean that's a really nice four. T.J. Warren, who knows when he's going to come back at this point? He is out indefinitely as of right now. The stress stress fracture in his foot hasn't been healing properly, so they said at least till November first and potentially beyond he'll be out. So that's unfortunate for them. But overall, it's a really nice starting five. They have some interesting depth pieces. So I think overall, this is a team that should be higher seeded in the Eastern Conference based on their talent and based on they have a good mix of uh, some defensive minded players. They have Sabonis and they have a lot of playmakers with Sabonis, Brogdon, McConnell. Now Duarte coming off the bench is going to be a nice three and D guy for them. So they have a good mix of depth. They have some shooting. They have some defenders on the perimeter and down in the post with Miles Turner. So they really do have a nice mix of everything. And there's no reason this team shouldn't be more competitive than they have been. And I think Rick Carlisle is the most ideal I mean, this is an NBA champion head coach. So this is the most ideal best case scenario for the Pacers this offseason in terms of hiring a new head coach. And uh, in my opinion, it's arguably the best head coaching hire of anybody this offseason. I think they got a good one. And I agree that this could potentially take them to the next level. I still think you need a guy that, you know, reminds me a little bit of the Pistons teams. This still doesn't feel like they have a superstar player. And I don't know if I see Brogdon, uh, potentially Sabonis, who I don't believe that, has made an all-star I mean, team. I, but. I think a lot of people, you know, or definitely would consider Sabonis on that superstar level. He's somewhere. He that that's that's he he's a huge like he's definitely a star easily. Uh, but that, hasn't even made an all-star play. team yet. He's oh, no, he's made two. Okay, no, he did last year. I don't know if he made it initially, but I think that, he ended up that getting... That is a big debate when it comes... That is a huge debate. When, is Sabonis a superstar in this? That is the... Superstar, I still don't know if I'm confident. When I think superstar, I think of a guy that can carry you and take you to the next level single-handedly. And when you need a bucket or you need a guy to rely on, that's the guy you go to. I don't know if Sabonis is quite that. I think that he's really close, but uh, I still, I just, I don't know if I can consider him that. He's definitely an all-star. He has made back-to-back all-star appearances. So let me clear that. I wasn't sure if he made an all-star team, but he did sneak in. He didn't get voted in either year. He snuck in both times, but he didn't make it and deservedly so both seasons. But yeah, I mean, I think they just need one of these guys to step forward and become a superstar for them and take Sabonis the last two seasons has been very consistent in what he's done and being a playmaker, a great rebounder, scoring over 20 points for him. But I think I'd really 
you know, do you put him in that Jokic category? I don't think quite yet. So I think he could. Not that. He also remember he also led. Not only can he rebound and score, he he also he he also what he also he had he ever both assists on their team last season. Mm-hmm. So he has all the elements. I don't know. Like you said, he's not. He's like a lighter version of Jokic. Jokic is a superstar. We know this. He he. He's just like a step below you. He, he's not. He just needs a. If he just does it again for one more season, then yeah, I think it's time to put him as a superstar. But yeah, I tend to agree. He's not. He's right on the cusp. Just. Yeah. He's knocking on. He's knocking on the door. You know. He's trying to pick the lock. <laughs> you know. He's just not quite there yet. He's like halfway there, so he's close. Um, all right, let's go over their depth chart then. So as of right now in the backcourt, they have Malcolm Brogdon and Karis LeVert starting. Behind them, they have TJ McConnell, Jeremy Lamb, uh, Chris Duarte. They, they did have Edmund Sumner, who they thought was going to make the team, but as of uh, like a half an hour ago before we started recording, he tore his ACL in practice today. So he's no longer going to be a part of the equation for him, but they still have some decent depth, especially with Duarte there. Uh, and a good mix, too, of guys that can score and defend. I would say their bench is more defensive-minded than guys that are going to get you buckets. But Duarte is going to have to be their main scorer coming off the bench. And that's why I agree with you. It was a nice pick for them because they're in a position where they're not rebuilding. They're trying to win. So taking Duarte, who was the oldest player in the draft, is a smart move because from day one, he's probably going to be their top scorer coming off the bench, especially you could have said potentially it was going to be Justin holiday, but he's probably going to slide in the starting lineup for TJ Warren at the three with Torrey Craig backing him up there. So um, in the front court, you have Sabonis and miles Turner. If we're being honest, when you look at who they have behind them, uh, there's not much to talk about right now. Isaiah Jackson is going to be the main guy backing both of them up. But beyond that, uh, they really don't have anybody who's ever played significant minutes. We don't even know who's going to make this team to back up Sabonis and Turner beyond Isaiah Jackson. So as a rookie, you could see Isaiah Jackson playing an average of 20 plus minutes a game. I think right off the bat, because you kind of yeah. he kind of has to. They don't really have yeah. another option. Yeah. They have that uh, George Bedazzi. Or whatever his name is. Yeah, and he got injured during summer league as well. Oh, so th- they're not even sure if he's gonna. He's questionable to start the season. So yeah, that's what I mean. That it's he was definitely gonna make wow, the team and provide tough. depth. But. Isaiah, Je- man. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's obviously the talk of this uh, depth chart. I mean, we we know, like you said, they're fine in the they're fine in the backcourt and they're fine on the wing as well. That none of that's a concern, but this front court behind Sabonis and Turner, not it be it would be one thing if Sabonis and Turner both you know had are able to stay relatively healthy and you know, but Turner has been has been battling injury concerns for a while now, and he he's really struggled to stay healthy the past couple of seasons. So if there's a situation where Miles Turner goes down. Like he did last season, and what Miles Turner missed over over twenty games last season. If that happens again, you're gonna see Isaiah Jackson slide into a role that I'm not sure he's ready for. Uh, that's, yeah, and that's very concerning. I mean, I like I I like for Isaiah Jackson. This is a right now. This is a great spot. But it's only a great spot if I, if Miles Turner and Sabonis are supposed to stay healthy. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about it in Isaiah Jackson's prospect profile. He is very raw. This isn't a guy that was ready to come in day one and provide quality minutes. He's a high-energy guy. He'll provide you that. I think he'll be a decent rebounder and a guy that can block some shots for you. Offensively, he's definitely not ready for the NBA. So, yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely going to be He's going to have to get ready quick. Uh, Yeah, he has to be ready like now, because the reality is it would be shocking if Miles Turner and Sabonis both played the entire season. So you're probably going to see Isaiah Jackson start a few games this season, if we're being honest about it. 
I'm waiting. They're, they're half the, you know, before the season starts, I'm sure they're going to add some yeah. kind of depth in the front court. They're going to sign somebody. Yeah, this. you would think so. Uh, you know, and I've been surprised they haven't been more involved because we've seen a few bigs get signed over the last two weeks or so. I the Pacers. Like them. I would have liked them to go out and get Paul Millsap. Yeah, I mean, even DeAndre Jordan wouldn't have been bad. He went to the Pistons. Uh, I mean, just any sort of depth, honestly, at this point. And I agree, they'll definitely make... I mean, they kind of have to make a move. It's not that they may make a move. They kind of have to if they want to fill out a roster here. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's going to be interesting to see who they pick up there. We've already seen some of the teams that we've already done uh, previews for go and grab some guys as well. So... Uh, the Pacers, I wouldn't be surprised if we post this and then two days after they go out and get themselves a big. So uh, let's see. Let's go over the future then. You already alluded to it earlier. This is a team you're intrigued by. So where do you have them finishing next season? Uh, as I said, since we haven't done our official predictions yet, I'm not going to give an exact spot. Because, uh, you know, you know, Fair. obviously. Obviously, you know, these things could change. You know, the other moves can be made. Guys can go down. Stuff can happen before the season starts. Uh, but honestly, they're going to be somewhere between five and eight. There's, I don't see a situation where they're not in the top eight this season. I mean, uh, if they, if they would have brought in anybody other than Rick Carlisle, I think they probably would have missed the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Again, because they haven't proved they can do it with, you know, a less than experienced coach. Uh, but Rick Carlisle is going to come in, and I think he's going to, assuming health, because this team struggled to stay healthy. Now, if this team gets to, gets stuck, hits, gets to uh, hit by the injury bug again, then this is a whole, then this is just, you know, the same thing that it's been the past several seasons. Uh. But honestly, they're going to be somewhere between five and eight. I mean, I think this team's going to be good if they can stay healthy. They're going to be a good team. Yeah, I don't think I trust them enough to stay healthy, if we're being honest about it. And I am a little concerned with that depth behind Turner and Sabonis. I think that could definitely come to bite them as well. But I will say it's hard. Rick Carlisle is one of those coaches where— you can't tell me a Rick Carlisle team with this much talent is going to miss the playoffs. Yeah, and that's why it's tough to say that. I mean, I think that they're going to find themselves in the Eastern Conference. I'm excited to do our standings predictions because every time I look at it, I'm like, man, I just don't know. Because yeah, when you're saying... we done already, like, I said some teams will finish in a certain spot, by, but by the time we actually do these these standings and really take a deeper look at it um, it's going to be way off of what I've said for each team yeah it's really tough because when you look at teams they could potentially they, so they were the nine seed last year you know they could pass the Wizards they could probably play better than the Knicks and pass the Knicks so that would put them in the seven seed but then I would put the Bulls ahead of them I think the Raptors could be around the same level this season so could they find themselves as a nine seed potentially again just they pass two teams but then two teams go above that I think it's possible that they'll be right around the nine seed again yeah I like I said somewhere between five they have the potential to be as high as four or five if we're being honest yeah, they definitely, especially Rick Carlisle has the ability to take them to that level. It's just going to be a question for them if they can stay healthy. If they get T.J. Warren back midseason, I think that'd be pretty big because then you're talking that gives them a little more depth with pushing Holiday to the bench. So I think overall it's going to be an interesting season for them. And this is really their opportunity to put up or shut up because this is a good roster that should be more competitive than they have been. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of people took Nate McMillan for granted because this team was a solid five seed almost every year on a dime with Nate McMillan. And they wanted to take it to the next level. Uh, Nate Jorkin couldn't take them there. And I think Rick Carlisle can take them back to that potential five seed that they were with Nate McMillan. And we saw Nate McMillan. Nate McMillan have a ton of success last year with the Hawks. So I think he was definitely underrated and underappreciated with the Pacers. But 
yeah, it's going to be an intriguing season for them. Like I said, I'm looking forward to doing my standings predictions because I feel like we'll look at our Eastern Conference predictions at the end of the year and be like, holy Jesus, we were way off. So I think it'll be a fun one to do and a fun one to break down. So that's it for the Pacers in this episode. Uh, Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate that support. And we will see you guys next time for the Washington Wizards. Yep.